All right, it's great to see everybody at church. Good to have you here with us. I want to welcome our church family and all of our guests. We're so glad that you are here. We've been hoping that you might come, and we pray that you'll come back and be a part of all that God's doing in the lives of people here. I want to say hello to everybody at turningpointchurch.tv, watching wherever you may be all over the, the world really now, and we're just glad to have you a part of what, of what he's doing here. As we continue our series today, I Love My Church, we're in part four. And we just finished up around 28, 29 small group meetings called PI meetings, Pastors Information Exchange meetings. And, and I loved my church before then, but just having a, a, a few moments to spend with the different people that God's brought to our church and to hear the stories just have so impacted me. And, and I love our church even more as I hear about uh, how God's love and, and grace have impacted people time after time all over in every area and, and, and in the house, whether it's the parking lot of the children's ministry or whether it's one of, one of our small groups or however, uh, th that God is just on the move and he's touching people in a big way. And, and that's why I love my church and, and I, that's why I love God's house. I love, I love what he's doing and I love, I love God's house. In fact, I have a passion for God's house, the church. And I'm in good company. King David, he said in Psalm 69, 9, he said, passion for your house has consumed me. And then even Jesus, when he was turning over the money changers in the temples, his, his disciples remembered this scripture and also said passion for God's house consumed him. And and, and I think about how, man, I want my life to be marked by passion. And, and I can't think of a greater cause than the cause of Christ in the local church going in the earth today. So passion for God's house. There's something powerful about God's house. I love God's house. And David, uh, speaking uh, to his son, Solomon, uh, we see in the scriptures, if you'll look with me real quick in First Chronicles 22, he, he said, it's been in my heart to build a house for the Lord. And I just love that idea of legacy and how King David's passion, now he's passing that on to his son. And, and uh, even though he helped fund the, 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 the house for God, Solomon is actually the one who carried it out. And so we see this, this generational thing of this passion that's passed on. And I think, parents, it's just a good idea and a good practice for us to have a passion for God's house and then to pass on that value to our kids. In fact, we wanted to create a church and a house where every generation could get something, where, where not only the kids are excited, but mom and dad are excited. Not only is mom and dad excited, but grandma and grandpa are excited about what God's doing in the house. And I love, I love what he's doing in the house. And together, as we pray and as we serve and as we give and as we participate, each of us is contributing to building the house of God in the local church in our generation. And I think about what could happen now, as we've seen God do that over the last 12 years, what could happen now if every person who calls Turning Point would begin to have this passion to begin to help us pray and serve and give and build? I believe we can continue to change the world for Jesus Christ. We want to build a house for God, and we say it like this, so that it's real hard to go to hell from Henry County because of what God's doing in the house, because God loves Henry County. And I believe his plan to help reach that is the local church. And that's why we love this house. And that's why we're going to continue to give and pray and serve to expand this house. And in your worship guide, I, I told you last week, but next week, we're actually celebrating 12 years as a church, which is, is huge. It's, it's so profound that we're able to, to continue to see growth and lives being changed. And, and now we're at a place where we're in five services. And so we, we're, we're glad to do that and make room for people. But we also realize it's time to build again. And so we're going to be breaking ground this May uh, to move in next June of 2016 into a new 26,000 square foot facility that will give us 13 acres total and 40,000 square foot to be able to, to create an environment where people can still come and hear the good news and the life-changing message message of Christ. And so next week, we're going to begin, uh, as we always do on our anniversary, as we take up a legacy offering, uh, just as a memorial. So if you call Turning Point your home, I'm asking you to pray and to ask the Lord what he wants you to give. And I think as we all sacrifice together in faith and in worship, I mean, we're going to see, we're going to see God do some exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think kind of things, because we are committed to build God's house. And so that's what I want to ask you to do as we think about that. But when we think about why we're we doing that, well, because 80% of Henry County is still not planted in a local life-giving 
church. And that's why we do what we do, because we believe that the local church is God's plan to, to extend and to reach people with the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. So it's a big deal. It's a big value here at Turning Point, And we do have a passion for that. And when we do that, you know, when we embrace our place in the house and we realize that every single one of us, we all have something to offer. Every part of, every part of, uh, of the house. And if you call Turning Point your home and you found your place, get planted, get activated, and, and know that everything that you need is in the Father's house. Everything that you could ever uh, need is in your father's house. In fact, my life was changed 20 years ago when I walked into the father's house and experienced his grace and his love and his passion. And so I, I've been so honored and humbled to be able to be a part of what he's doing for the last 20 years. Can I tell you, in hindsight, man, there's nothing I would rather have done in the last 20 years of my life than to commit my everything to building the local church for the glory of God. So today we're going to look and we're going to answer the question, what is church? We talked about the house being built on sacrifice. We talked about we do whatever it takes to bring people to Jesus. Last week we talked about uh, that turning point is a place where messy people are welcome, how God wants to turn their mess to a message. Well, today I'm going to teach a little bit more. That's why I brought out my whiteboard. So we're going to learn today. We're going to do a little teaching and I and, uh, hope you got your outlines ready. If you want to go ahead and grab those, we're going to jump right in today as we answer the question, what is church? What does that mean? When someone says we have church or let's go to church, like is it just the building? What does that mean? We're going to look at that idea and what that actually means from God's word today. Let's go to Genesis 28. Genesis 28. Now, I'm going to read several scriptures here, and if, uh, if, if you find yourself drifting, take authority over your mind and bring yourself right back to the Word, all right? So we're going to read some scripture and follow along with me. I'm actually going to go Genesis 10 uh, through 22. You may have 21, but it's actually 22. Here, here, here we go. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. And as he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down uh, on the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather, Abraham, and the God of your father, Isaac. The ground you are laying on belongs to you, and I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the, the dust of the earth, and they will spread out in all directions, to the west, the east, the north, and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. Verse 15, what's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go, and one day I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've finished giving you everything that I've promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. But he also was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It's none other than the house of God. It's none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up early. He took the stone he had rested his head against and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. And he named that place Bethel, which means house of God which was previously called Luz, then Jacob made this vow. If God indeed will be with me and protect me on this journey, if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. Verse 22. And this memorial I have set up, and I will present to God a tenth of everything that he gives to me. So you think about this, this moment where Jacob uh, has this aha moment. He has laid his head down on a stone. I mean, man, can you imagine a stone as your pillow? <laughs> like, that's rough when think, you think about that. But he, he lays his head down on a stone, and he sleeps. He has this encounter. He sees this, this ladder, this stairway to heaven. And we see uh, this moment where he becomes aware of the presence of God. Now, this is the first time in Scripture that we see that uh, the word house of God is mentioned. And I know that we have thought and taught that the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2, and it was. I mean, that's the, the fulfillment of that, where the Holy Spirit came and filled them up, and they went out and testified, and thousands got saved and added to the church. Well, this is actually the first place in Scripture that the word house of God is mentioned, and really it's a type or a shadow uh, of the church to come. 
And this rock that he laid his head down on represents Christ, the chief cornerstone, who is the head of the church. But then he, he, he called it Bethel, and, which means house of God. And it comes from the two words, uh, Bethlehem and Elohim. Bethel, the house of God or house of God. Of bread, And this is where we see this idea of church come from. And so I want to pull some things out of this moment where Jacob encounters the presence of God. And he declares, this is the house of God. But why, I just, I think about why did he say that? What is church? Let's, let's look in your notes. Here's the first thing that church is. Church is a connection. Church is a connection. It's where we connect with God. And let me say it like this. We don't come to church just to attend church. We come to church to connect with God. And if we don't connect with God, we've not had church. That's the whole goal of what we do in this building. We know the building's not the church. The building just holds the church. Because we, the people of God, together we are the church. Each of us a living stone. Now, yeah, you can connect with God outside of this environment and this gathering. We want you to. We want you to take this weekend ex experience into the Monday, Tuesday. That's why we give you the Soap Devotional Daily Bible Reading Plan. In fact, that's the most important thing we do at Turning Point is to teach you how to have a daily personal devotion because that is the catalyst. That is the key. And you get that going day after day. When you show up on Sunday, you should just be hitting the pinnacle because you've been going through every day. But when we come to church, church is about a connection. It's a connection with God. It's not about the music. It's not about the message. Uh, it is about the presence of God. And we want you to connect with the very presence of God, each and every one of us. Now, let's look at verse 12, because it says, As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from heaven, from earth to heaven. Now, I don't know if this were, is where Mr. Robert Plant got his idea for the famous song, Stairway to Heaven. But here's what we do know. This is known as Jacob's Ladder. This is known as Jacob's ladder, and he saw angels going up and down. It was the gateway to heaven, is what he said. He said, this is the house of God. There's this gateway to heaven. There was this connection that he had made. Now, Jesus, fast forward, Jesus, in John chapter 1, comes on the scene and kind of uh, piggybacks off of this because all the Jewish people knew about Jacob's ladder. I mean, it was a very significant. They knew about Bethel. They knew about the house of God. They knew about the ladder and, and seeing angels going up and down from, from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. And so Jesus comes on the scene in verse uh, 51 of, of John 1. And he says this. He said, I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open up and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. In essence, Jesus was saying, you've heard about Jacob's ladder. Well, really, that was just pointing to me because I am the ladder. I am the gateway to heaven. And that's why when we have church, when we connect with God, say in this place, the message of Christ is preached and that is the gateway to heaven. Why? Because Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus is the ladder. And so that's why in this place that we gather in is so significant because it can be the gateway to heaven as we preach the life-changing message of Christ. But, but why did he say this is church? Let's go back to verse 16. Verse 16. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. Like, God was there, and he wasn't aware of it. You know, God is everywhere all the time, and he's omniscient. He's everywhere. But there are times where we're not aware of that. In fact, there was a time in my life where I wasn't aware of the presence of God. And church is the moment that we become aware of the very presence of God. That's why he said... He was here, and I wasn't aware of it. So when we connect in church, connecting is all about me becoming aware of the very presence of God. In fact, that's really the whole goal of what we do here at Turning Point. When we, when we pray and when we prepare for these weekend gatherings, it's not about the, the song list or the lights or the cameras or the, 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 the coffee or anything, the environment. It's nothing about those things. What we are doing is we are praying and preparing because when we pray and prepare, 
We prepare the way of the Lord. And when, the, when we do that, the glory and the presence of God shows up because we want to create an environment where, peop, where people will come in from all over. And when they come into this environment, they become aware of the very presence of God. And we know that one moment in God's presence can change everything about a person's situation. It's, it, one moment in God's presence will do more than a thousand sermons. One, one moment in God's presence will do more than, than anything else in this life. And so that's what church is all about, is the moment that we connect. We connect, and really we haven't gone to church until we've connected with God. And that's why he said, aha, uh -huh. can I tell you, the same God that Jacob encountered is in this place today. The presence of God is in this place today. My question is, are you aware of that? Because it's, it's amazing how people can come into an environment where the presence of Jesus is and still not connect. So, so it's, uh, it's important that when we come to church, we come with the intention to connect. We don't come to church to be entertained. We don't come to church to see our favorite speaker. We come to church to be engaged by the very presence of Almighty God. So connect today. That's when we're having church. It's when we connect with Jesus. Come on, say amen to that. That's what church is, is a connection. It's a connection. It's this, this engaging of, of the power and the presence of God, which is why I've loved our pie meetings because I heard person after person Say, they came into the building and they just felt something. They, you know, they, they came into a small group or they came into our children's ministry or it was in the worship or in the... But they felt the presence of God. They came to a fall festival to get popcorn and do free rides and they felt something. What was that? It was the presence of Jesus. See, that's our whole goal at Turning Point is to get the glory and the presence of Jesus because if we can just get people to encounter Jesus, man, they'll be forever changed and they will know for themselves that God is in this place. Yes, it was funny, one of the guys who, uh, who's now on our outreach team is uh, he was telling his story and he said that he got lost and his GPS messed up. He turned around in our parking lot and when he pulled through the parking lot, he said, the Holy Spirit said, you are here. <laughs> so we, we weren't even having a service. And thank God, Jesus was here. And Jesus got him on the property and says, you're home. This is where you belong. And so we want the presence of Jesus in this place. But we have church. We connect, which is why, you know, if I could just pastor you for a moment here, especially as we grow more services and as we, we, we see God do that, that um, our goal is to connect with the presence of God. And as great as the online um, tool is that we have here to help people who may not live in the area or who may be sick or are shut in or whatever the reason is they're out of town, that's a great option. But if you're in the area and you call Turning Point your home, let's not lean on that as your avenue for, for, for experiencing church because there's something significant that happens in this place. You see, it's not just about uh, a live speaker. It's about encountering the Word of God. Because I don't want you to encounter Mike Turner. I want you to encounter Jesus Christ. But there's something that happens in the worship that can't happen when you're not here. Does that make sense? So, again, that's okay to use that. But the, I want you to see that the goal of church is to connect with the presence of God. It's to hear the voice of God. That's what happened with Jacob. He had this encounter. Here's the second thing. is It's a conversation. Not only is it a connection, it's a conversation. God and Jacob had a conversation. And that's so cool. Did you know that God wants to have a conversation with you? Like God wants to speak to you. Every time we have church, every time we have church, God wants to speak to you. And really it's a conversation because that's why I love worship. We don't just do worship to kind of create some space before the message. Worship really is our opportunity to talk to God. We say, you're worthy, you're holy, you're my cornerstone, you're my, my strength, uh, I love you. And, and so we're speaking to God, but then also in worship, God can speak to us. But then also in the word, the message, uh, the time of our time here together. So there's a conversation. And really, that's what we want you to experience every time we gather, is that there's worship there's conversation. There's some interaction. And, and, and that's why, you know, when we think about how um, God speaks to us, and another really uh, cool thing I thought was people that were sharing 
in the pie uh, of how they would come into the, to the church and they would say, it was like the message was just speaking right to me. Like there was nobody else in the room and it was just from me. Or did the pastor have a, you know, a, a, a spy cam in our car or at our house? Like how, how did it speak? Here's how, because I wasn't there, but Jesus was there. And, and so God speaks to you in church and he lets you know you're in the right place, this is the right people, and this is the right plan. You're in the right place place. So God will speak to you, and it's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. So we see that it's a connection, but it's also a conversation. So how are some ways that God speaks to us? There's many ways. I wanted to just think about a few of how God speaks to me in worship. Uh, a lot of times it's in worship and also through the message. And, and there are three. I thought I'd give you a little, little illustration here uh, today. Uh, let's, say, let's say this is... Uh, North, south, east, west. And here is a street, four-way street. All right. Now let's say your destination is down here. Let's say this is the Geranium Festival. Okay? Here's the McDonough Square. Now, thousands of people come all over. And let's say you're in this car, and you're, let's just say that you're from out of town. All right, maybe you're from... I don't know, up north Georgia or maybe South Carolina, I don't know. But you're coming into town, you got some out-of-state tags, and here's a guy from our outreach team who's at the Geranium Festival passing out free waters, all right? And he's just out there because that, that's what we like to do is we like to give stuff away and just tell people that Jesus loves them and, and it just sheds light into their life. So let's say you're coming in and here you are, woohoo! You're just all out of the car, you know, and, and this guy notices your, and all of a sudden your festival, the festival is this way towards the square, but all of a sudden you hang a left and all, now you're coming out towards Turning Point Church. Well, this guy sees you and he starts waving you down. He's like, hey, 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 hold on, hold on, because he, he knows the festival's in town. He sees you out of state plates, so he's assuming that you're, you're wanting to go to the Geranium Festival, and he waves you down and says, stop, hold on, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. You need to turn around because your destination is this way. Now, let me ask you, does that make this guy mean or angry? No. Why? He's just trying to help you get to your destination. And what I've noticed is that the Lord will talk to me and he will correct me. And he will say, hey, you need to deal with that attitude. Or, hey, you're going the wrong way in that decision. Or, hey, you're thinking wrong about that. Or you did. And so God will just put his finger on something that I need to deal with. And it's amazing how in worship the Lord will speak to us. And one of the ways he does it is correction. And we need to be okay with our Heavenly Father correcting us because the Bible says don't be discouraged with the chastising or the correction of the Lord because the Lord corrects those whom He loves. And if He doesn't correct you, then you're not legitimate children. And so just like a loving father would correct his kids, so we see the first way that God speaks to us in worship is correction. All right? So He's not mad. He loves us. He's trying to get us to our destiny. Now let's say... Same thing happens, and let's move you, or let's move our outreach dream teamer closer to the corner here, all right? And he's standing there, he's smiling, he's got his free bottle of water. Now you stop, and it's one of those days where your phone was using GPS, it died, and you forgot your charger in the other car. So now... You don't have any way to know where you're going. So you know you're, in, you're near where you need to be going. You come to this place. You stop to get that awesome, awesome free bottle of water or Coke. And you, and you ask, hey, um, where, where is the Geranium Festival? Well, he says, if you'll hang a left right there, it'll take you right to it. Now, what happened here is this guy gave you direction. And so that's the second way God will speak to us in worship is we're at a crossroads. We're praying about a job or a situation with our child or maybe a financial opportunity or uh, a decision, whatever. And, and you're worshiping, and God will just, in that moment of worship, he'll just say, hey, you need to do this. You need... And so God will give us direction. That's why we need to connect. Can I tell you every problem that you have is a wisdom problem? And God has all wisdom regarding your situation. And if we'll connect with God and we'll be open to God, He will give us direction. So we see that that's the second way 
Now, let's just say in this third situation, you're coming through. You know where you're going. He, he, he sees you got your blinker on towards the square, but, but he, you still get your water. <laughs> and he says, hey, you're headed the right way. Here's your water. I see you got your blinker on. You're going the right way here. Freshen up. Enjoy the festival. So you're, you're, you, you already, this guy already knows where he's going. So there wasn't, direct, there wasn't direction or correction. There was just inspiration. In other words, you're going the right way. You're, you're doing the right thing. Keep it up. And that's the third way that God can speak to us in worship is we can be going through a challenging time. I mean, sometimes even when you do the right thing, you need to know that you're going to experience some resistance. You could be obeying God and still be going through a trial or a storm. Just because you obey God doesn't mean there won't be some kind of resistance or a fight because anything that makes a difference, understand, it will be required that we pray. That's why Paul said, I press toward the mark. Because even when you're trying to serve God and do the right thing, there's going to be some difficult times. But God in worship will say, hey, you're doing great. I got your back. I'm working all things together for your good. You're going in the right direction. Keep serving me. Keep trusting me. Keep, 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 keep going on. So God will inspire you in worship. So we see God will, he, he will give us the direction, correction, and inspiration. But God wants to speak to us in worship. That's why when we have church, it's about connecting, but it's also about conversation. Here's the third way. It's about, it's a commitment. It's a commitment. You know, Jesus, Jesus required a big commitment. Jesus would um, love you unconditionally. He, He gives you grace freely, loves you where you are, believes in you, died for you. But he also has a big, he has a big call, a big requirement. He would say things like, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean go get crucified. He, he just meant embrace a life of self-denial and realize it's not about my will, but God's will. And, and so when we follow Christ, it's a big commitment. Like it, salvation is free, but some guy, one guy said, it'll cost you everything. In other words, it's going to cost you your heart, your focus, your life, your use of your stewardship of your time, your talent, treasure. Like, he is your Lord, not just your Savior. He's your CEO. He's your boss. He's your chief. He's your prince. He's your king. And, and so really, when you think about church, not only is it, a, is it a connection, not only is it a conversation, it's a commitment. It's a commitment. Now, here's the thing, is that God is fully committed to every single one of you. God is committed to me. He committed to Jacob, and now Jacob makes a vow and recommits back to him. Because God says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bless you. I'll provide for you. I'll give you this land. All the families through the earth are going to be, I mean, God's just blessing, blessing, blessing. And we love it when God speaks that to us. We love because he's a blesser. Amen? He loves to bless his children. It's his pleasure to give us the kingdom. He's not stingy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why? Because God is a giver and he loves to give and bless. It's a part of his nature and he wants to bless us. Parents, we can understand that. Don't you like to bless your children? Don't you like to create op- the best opportunities, the best environments? I mean, you really do. You, you want the best and that, you get that from God and God wants that even more for us, but it takes commitment. It takes this commitment. So we see there's an interaction. And if we're going to commit, you know, let's say, let's go back to that point over there. If we're going the wrong way, we've got to commit if we turn around. To turn around takes commitment. Would you say yes to that? Absolutely. If we're going to have a turning point, there's this 180 degree moment where we're going the wrong way, but because God loves us, he tells us to go the right way. That takes commitment. We can say, you know what? I'm good. I got this. And we keep going in the, in the wrong way. And God will still love us, but it takes a commitment. And if we're going to have church, it takes commitment, commitment, just like with God and Jacob. God makes a commitment and Jacob, he commits back. In fact, that's why he said in verse 22, he said that um, if you'll provide for me, if you'll protect me in this journey, if you'll provide for me, and you think about that, that's what God says I'll do for you in this journey of life. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. I'll watch over you. And so now Jacob says, if you do that, you will certainly be my God. 
and I will worship you in this place. In other words, I'll worship you in the house of God, and I'll bring a tenth of everything that I produce. And I find that interesting because nobody told Jacob to do that. There wasn't a pastor. There wasn't a Bible. There was just something in him that understood maybe it was from his grandfather Abraham. Maybe he remembered the story of Abraham tithing, as we saw in Genesis uh, 17 when he tithed to Melchizedek. So granddad was a tither, then I'm going to tithe. Not because you need it, just because I love you. I worship you. I'm committed to you. And if we're going to commit to God, we are going to have to make this the same type of level of commitment. And it, it always has to do with what, what God's entrusted to us, which is our time, our talents, and our treasure. And every single one of us, every one of us, all have time, we all have talents, and we all have treasure that God has given to us. And so the way that we, we can show our commitment to God is how we steward that, how we offer that, and we make ourselves available to God for God's will and purpose in our life. And if you think about true commitment, I think it's interesting that Jacob talked about he would tithe. And true commitment is, is, is always connected to our treasure. I mean, you think about your marriage, you think about your family, you think about your children, your finances, your resources are connected to those things. Why? Because you love them. I mean, every good father, every good father wants to bless his kids and be able to give them things and experiences. Absolutely. But it, it, it's, it, it, your, your, your heart and your treasure are connected. If it's your spouse, you know, if you're a husband, you want to bless your wife. You want to, you want to honor her. You want to give her good things and, and provide. And, and so it's the same way in the kingdom of God. Wherever our treasure is, Jesus said, you'll find your heart. And if we want a heart for God's house... We've got to put our treasure there. Why? Because our heart follows our treasure. Look at Matthew 6, 21. This is what Jesus said. For wherever your treasure is, wherever your treasure is, you'll also find your heart there. In other words, your heart follows your treasure. And if I want my heart in the house of God, I, want, I need to put my treasure there. Because treasure and commitment go hand in hand. Have you ever said the phrase or somebody said to you, put your money where your mouth is? What were they saying? Oh, if you really believe that, let's bet on it, you know? It's like, I bet I can, I can make four three-pointers. Okay, put your money where your mouth is. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not really. I mean, because you put your money where your confession is. And as we confess Christ, really treasure, treasure doesn't rule us anymore. We, we have surrendered fully to Christ, and that's why... We put our treasure in the house of God. Why? Because we believe that's the heart of God. And we want our heart to be in the house of God. I remember as soon as I became aware of this, this topic of tithing, you know, for me, I, I was already serving. I was involved in student ministry and, and, and the you know, music ministry and outreach. But when I found out and began to really have this aha, I became aware of this, this, this practice and this principle of tithing, it wasn't about what I was going to get. Like, I didn't tithe so I could get rich. I tithed and still do because it was my opportunity to worship God in another way. It was an opportunity to worship God in an area that was very, very important to me because, you see, our treasure represents our time, our skill, and our sweat. And that's why when we offer that to the Lord, it's a commitment. It really is. And when you look through the Old Testament, not only with Abraham and Jacob, you see it going through the Old Testament. And it's still this principle of tithing. But I thought about Malachi 3 because now there literally is the house of God. And God is dealing with the people of Israel in Malachi 3.8. And he says, Should people cheat, cheat God? Yet you've cheated me. And you ask, what do you mean? And when did we ever cheat you? And he just makes it clear. He says, you cheated me of the tithes and the offerings due to me. And I think about that, the fact that God wasn't saying you've cheated me uh, because I need my money. You've cheated me and you've robbed me of the opportunity to bless you as my children. Because I want to bless you, but I do have an order. And there is an order to things. We talked about that in the God First Life. When order is restored, blessing is relieved. See, see this area of, of, of finances and tithing has nothing to do with money. It's got everything to do with our heart. And God knows our heart. And God knows what, what our heart desires. And so when we, when we tithe, 
we're saying, I'm committed to you. I'm committed to the God. See, God doesn't need my money, but I need God's blessing on my life. I need God's blessing on our church. And as I pray for you, church, I pray as I walk past those boxes and I lay hands and I say, God, I thank you that our church is 100% tithing families. Not because we need money, but because we want 100% of the families of our church walking in the blessing of God, where they have a surplus and an abundance. They never lack any good thing because they are blessed to be a blessing. They have more than they need. They have more than they could ever, ever, ever contain. And that That's where God wants us in this place of blessing. So he says, if you do, bring all the tithes. So there's food in my temple or my house or provision. He says, if you do, he says, I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour out blessings so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try me, put me to the test. And as your pastor, if you you call turning point, I just want to challenge you. I really do. I was so encouraged after the last service, I had a gentleman come up to me, just tears in his eyes. And he says, you know, I've been a Christian since 2001. He says, but you challenged me to tithe. And he said, we've been tithing since the beginning of this year. And he says, man, I'm just going to tell you, I'm so blown away. I'm so blown away. at what He said, thank you for challenging. So again, my heart is to help you. My name's Mike. I'm your friend. I want to help you. I'm not trying to get something from you. I, I'm telling you, I'm trying to get something to you where you can experience. So let God, let God like he did Jacob, show he is your provider, that he can be trusted. But we see that 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 there's this, this commitment. And so we're going to commit to tithing, but then also uh, next week we're going to give an offering. Now, an offering is above and beyond. We bring the tithe, but we give an offering. So that's why I'm saying you pray. We don't have to pray about the tithe. Because whether you made a dollar last week or a million, the tithe is the tithe. It's 10%. It's the first tenth, right? Now, an offering is above and beyond. So that's why I say, let's pray. Let's come in next week and let's offer that up to God. Why? Because we are committed to Christ. We are committed to the cause of God and what he's doing in this place. Now, if you're a visitor, if you're a guest, listen, we are not expecting you to give. We're not expecting you to sacrifice and help us make room. I'm talking to the people that call Turning Point their home. Like you say, this is your house I, I, I'm inviting you to join me in committing to take this next step as we launch out uh, into new territory for God's glory. Amen? So, so God committed to Jacob, but then here's what happens. Here's what happens. That night, God says, Jacob, I need you to go back and face your past. Because see, Jacob's name meant trickster, deceiver. His whole life, he was uh, he, he was very charismatic, and he, had to, he knew how to work people and things and situations, and he was, he was always in his own strength figuring out how to manipulate and deceive and get what he wanted, and, and that's just the way he, he was. And, and God says, you're going to have to go back and face your past. And so he and God wrestle and struggle all night long. And Jacob says, I'm not going to let, let you go until you bless me. And God says, okay, I'm going to bless you. And God changes his name. They struggle all night, and God God changes his name from Jacob, which means trickster and deceiver, into Israel, which means prince of God. It literally means one who struggles, but God prevails. And can I tell you, that's what church is. You come struggling. You connect with God, and you are struggling, but God prevails in you and changes you so that you can leave changed and different and prevail in life and walk in a place of victory. That is what church is about. What is church? It's a connection. It's a conversation. It's a commitment. So would you bow your head? I want to pray with you. I want to ask you, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? What is God speaking to you? Have you become aware of the presence of Jesus in this place? Well, I remember when I became aware of the reality of Jesus. It broke me. Brought me to my knees. And I believe today he wants to reveal himself to you. And you got to know that he is the gateway. He's the gateway. He's the only way. But he loves you. He's committed to you. That's why he laid down his life 2,000 years ago on the cross and was brutally beaten and pierced because he loves you. He's committed to you. Have you committed to him today? I want to ask you, if that's you, say, Mike, 
I would, I, I'm aware of the presence of Jesus in this place and I realize I need to bow my knee. I need to make him the Lord. I want to give him everything. I want to, I want to know him. I want to connect. I want to be changed so that I can prevail in life and fulfill my purpose. Would you pray for me? I'd love to pray for you. Or maybe you're here and I want to pray for you. If maybe you've fallen away from the Lord, maybe you had a walk with the Lord at one time and something happened, it doesn't really matter what. Here, here's what matters. God's brought you into this place and you're aware of his presence and he's ready to embrace you. He's ready to restore you. If you'll just commit to him, if you'll surrender to him, he'll change you, transform you. And you can leave this place different than when you entered. If that's you, you say, Mike, that's me. For either of those two areas, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hand, and I believe you're going to encounter his presence. You ready? One, two, three. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. Yeah, all over the building. Hand high, hand high. Thank you, God. All over. Awesome, awesome. Yes, Lord, all over the building. Yeah. Mm, Thank you, God. Put your hands down. Now, Father, I thank you for every hand that was raised. And I just declare your grace over their lives. I declare freedom. And Lord, as they've come to you, that you are transforming them and changing them. A new day, a fresh start. That, God, they're free from their past. And now they're going to walk in total commitment to you. A new day, a name change, a fresh start a place of victory and abundance as they commit to you that they are going to fulfill your purpose in your house, in their generation, by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, give him a good hand.